I knew it would come eventually. AI has made its impact on games and we're not playing games here. We are simulating games and we're gonna talk about what that means. And Sasha, you're saying this time it's Google, not Blizzard, Google. We're back to Google. It's not Google Stadia, just Google. And the internet is going crazy over this thing called Game Engine. That's capital N, like gamer speak. I don't know if you play games like that when you're a little kid, but gamer yeah. speak, Game Engine. So what is Game Engine? Yeah, it's basically a neural network that's simulating the game Doom. And I actually love the fact that everyone is going back to Doom and running Doom on everything from pregnancy tests to, to toasters to microwave ovens. <laughs> Um, but in this instance, they've actually got enough training data and, and put it in these models that it's actually simulating the game and not just like, you know, some of the like uh, textures and, and it's, it's going through and actually simulating the mechanics and, you know, you can move around and actually do a lot of the, the gameplay that the, the original game had, which is changes. It's a big paradigm shift in the same way that, um, you know, Sora was in the video generation space. Yeah, that's pretty amazing because you're saying that this is not just generating video. This is generating a entirely immersive environment, which means like 3D game design, you know, typically you, you sort of design it all in 3D and you kind of know where the map is and you plan all that out. You're saying all this is sort of just being made up on the fly. Yeah, and I mean, to an extent, it's being regurgitated from, you know, input data and training data, which it's learned from the actual original game. So a game already was created to create this data, but it does basically unlock one extra step where in the same way that Sora could now be used to generate synthetic, you know, video to, to build out more data sets. Like this is a similar sort of concept where you could now use some of the mechanics that you unlock and to accelerate game development or create whole new games from scratch now as well. I love the retro. Again, I played Trade Wars as a text-based game. I think AI can do that today, but going back to the, the, old, the old days, huh? So the next headline is one that's a little nerdier side is uh, Magic LTM2 Mini has now a context window of 100 million, 100 million context size. That's just huge because, you know, typically Gemini was 2 million. 100 million means like you don't have to use RAG anymore. Potentially you just throw everything at the model. You don't have to select it. It just knows everything that's in there. And that's pretty exceptional because I'm hating rag these days with the work we're doing here at Headline. Yeah, so you're right. Like, I mean, a hundred million token window um, basically approaches, you know, the size of a whole code base. And when you get to something that big, you're right. You stop essentially needing rag. And and it's, it's kind of interesting because in, in the same way that your brain knows what it knows and where it learned it, this is a similar sort of concept where it's basically attributing a specific hash uh, to each of the you know individual data points, and then it's able to basically come back to that specific point. Um, and what it allows is, let's say, if you have a massive code base and something there's a bug in a specific component, you can actually go back and triage and, and find that specific hash that applied to that and actually solve it at the root cause. So it's super super impressive, um, especially I mean, 100 million token window. I mean, that's that's the size of something like 50 textbooks. So it's a huge amount of information that it can take in and, and a massive step forward. I don't think people realize in like these days how all these LLMs are being fed data through the system called RAG, Retrieval Augmented um, Generation. And it's clunky, it's super clunky. A lot of the demos look slick, but they're all setups. To actually do use RAG in production is non-trivial. And uh, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking, oh God, let's just have big context windows and boom, there we go, 100 million. So that's pretty awesome. All right, so uh, you have now been vindicated. Uh, Shrubbery exists because technically now the government knows about it. So the headline is OpenAI and Anthropic. So, you know, rivals come together. They announced early access to the federal government to look into these Shrubbery demos. And this is unconfirmed because anything related to the government, this is like areas, you know, Area 51, but they have now access to Strawberry. So should I be scared? Yeah, I mean, no, I think this is a, is a, is a step in the right direction. And, and honestly, I think it's what a lot of people would expect to happen when, when something this big uh, of development this big happens. So, you know, we heard a lot of rumors um, the weeks leading up to this. And, you know, it's actually interesting to see that there is, again, theoretically, some substance to it. 
Um, and I wouldn't be surprised um, if this sort of trend continues as we see bigger and bigger developments, that it does sh gradually shift into more of a political and a national security uh, realm. So I do see that line getting um, blurrier as things go along. And there's a great um, post by Leopold Aschenbrenner, uh, where he speaks a lot about the risks of the geopolitical implications. And honestly, I, I, I do agree with him as these um, capabilities do develop um, the significance for national security and on geopolitical stability does increase as well. And, you know, a few weeks ago, you were like, Sam Altman's dropping strawberry photos on his Twitter. He's going to drop it. He's going to drop it. And now this week he submits it to the government to take a look. It's like so formal. It's like giving him his taxes. So yeah. uh, I guess and we're not going rogue yet. It's going to be very sort of safe and uh, aligned, super alignment, I guess. Yeah. And I, I think actually it makes sense to actually give uh, the Defense Department a lot of access so they can basically start to run their models and their simulations internally of like, hey, what does the front lines start to look like when some of these tools get deployed? So I think it's actually a, a, a net positive because it means you don't get a situation where, you know, in the war room, people have too many unknowns. It's actually, okay, we, we're familiar with it. We can develop countermeasures. We can protect against it and we know what's going on and we can reach this kind of like balance equilibrium again. Sasha, you're doing a plug for our AI in Battlefields episode that didn't do so well. So I, <laughs> I appreciate the plug. Yeah. AI in Battlefields. VC's talking about war, right? But I think, I mean, when you zoom out and you look at, you know, how like this week's stories around like game engine level simulation, like near infinite context windows through to, you know, reasoning being unlocked, it really is like moving in a very, very clear direction here. And I think when you zoom out, you look at just how many of these headlines come out on a weekly or monthly basis. I think, you know, you hear the, the phrase that AI is losing a lot of steam. And again, I'd, I'd go back to look at what the research community is doing and what they're pioneering. It might take a year or two for that to commercialize, but the frontier there is, is moving very, very quickly. Yeah, it is exciting indeed. Okay. Take care of that in Australia. I'll see you next week. Sounds good. See ya.